Chapter 23, Children and Adolescent, Part 3. Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD, is characterized by a persistent pattern of angry mood and defiant behavior. It occurs more frequently than usual for individuals in a comparable age group and developmental level. This disorder typically begins by age 8 and usually not later than early adolescence. It interferes with social, educational, and vocational activities. And the comorbidity that usually exists with this disorder is ADHD, anxiety, major depression, conduct disorder, and substance use disorder. Predisposing factors for ODD. Biological influence have not clearly been established, although they do believe there is a connection between genetics and temperament. There is not a clear connection between genetics or biochemical alterations and ODD. Family influence. So there may be power struggles between the parent and the child. The next few slides will go through the nursing process. So the assessment of ODD is characterized by passive aggressive behavior such as stubbornness, procrastination, disobedience, carelessness, negativism, testing of limits, resistance to direction, deliberate ignoring the communication of others, unwillingness to compromise. Other symptoms that may be evident are running away, school avoidance, school underachievement, temper tantrums, fighting, argumentative. Usually these children do not see themselves as oppositional, but view the problem as arising from others whom they believe are making unreasonable demands on them. These children are often friendly, friendless, perceive human relationships as negative and unsatisfactory. School performance, performance is usually poor because of their refusal to participate and their resistance to external demands. So possible nursing diagnosis or Outcome identification for our ODD patients include noncompliance with therapy related to a negative temperament, denial of problems, underlying hostility. And then we have defensive coping related to retarded ego development, low self-esteem, unsatisfactory parent-child relationship. Here are some more nursing diagnoses, low self-esteem related to lack of positive feedback, retarded ego development, an impaired social interaction related to negative temperament, underlying hostility, manipulation of others. So our goals or outcomes for our ODD patients. Complies with treatment by participating in therapy without negativism accepts responsibility for his or her part in the problem, takes direction from staff without being defensive, does not manipulate other people, verbalizes positive aspects about self, interacts with others in a proper manner. So I do want to refer you guys to table 23-7 in your textbook. It has a comprehensive care plan there for our ODD patients. Um, our planning implementation matches our outcome goals for our ODD patient, right? So the intervention should encourage cooperation with therapy. They should um, encourage ownership of behaviors, increase self-worth, feelings of self-worth, as well as interacting appropriately with others. Evaluation for our ODD clients. So the evaluation phase of the nursing process requires a reassessment of the plan of care to determine if the actions were effective and have we met our goals for therapy. Conduct disorder. 
With conduct disorder, or CD for short, there is repetitive and persistent pattern of behavior in which basic rights of others or majority age-appropriate societal norms and rules are violated. Physical aggression is common and peer relationships are disturbed. This is one of the most frequent reasons that children and adolescents are referred to psychiatric intervention. It occurs more often in males than females and the onset is from childhood to adolescence. Comorbidities um, that are common with conduct disorder include ADHD, mood disorder, learning disorders, and substance use disorders. Predisposing factors for conduct disorder so there is some belief that genetics may play a part, but there is also thought that environmental risk factors may be an influence um, and not necessarily just genetics. However, the temperament um, of a child can be seen as early as birth um, and up to age of two, if a um, child is showing irritable temperament, for compliance or inattentiveness, impulsiveness, then it is quite um, common that they may uh, develop conduct disorder later in life. So as far as our neurobiological um, influences, so there has been some studies which showed that there may be some brain structures that are abnorm abnormal for our conduct disorder patients, as well as neurotransmitters such as serotonin that has been found to be high, when cerebral fluid has been found to be low, and um, patients with aggression and violence. So there may be some type of biological influence for this disease. And the third finding was that aggressive children had significantly greater relative um, right brain, right frontal brain activity than those who were healthy and controlled with their behaviors. So psychosocial influences, so peer relationships, um, poor academic performance and social maladaptation often leads to affiliation with deviant peer groups. So these students then find people that behave similar to them. There is some evidence that engaging in risky behavior can yield and reinforcement both on a social level from acceptance, you know, in their peer group. And studies have shown that risk taking may be associated with reward related brain activity. So doing risky behaviors, then they get like a sense of satisfaction. So some family influences are believed to influence our conduct disorder development. So this chaotic disruption of family life, such as parental rejection and consistent management with harsh discipline, parental sociopathy, lack of parental supervision. Family influences continued. Frequent changes in residence, economic stressors, parents with antisocial personality disorder or alcohol dependency, marital conflict and divorce. The next few slides will go over the nursing process for our conduct disorder patients. So the classic characteristics for conduct disorder is usually physical aggression and the violation of other of the rights of others. So during your assessment, you're looking for um, behavior patterns manifesting itself in virtually all areas of the child's life. So home, school, peer, and community. They may still lie. They may have truancy issues. The child lacks feelings of guilt and remorse for these things. 
So some of the assessment findings could be the use of drugs and alcohol, um, sexual promiscuous behavior, low self-esteem, and problems with impulse behavior, hyperactivity, or inattentiveness. Assessment continued. So you may also observe lack of feelings of guilt and remorse, the use of projection as a defense mechanism, inability to control anger, low academic achievement. So characteristics include frustration, tolerance, irritability, frequent temper outbursts. The patient may also suffer from anxiety and depression and they may have a low IQ in relation to their age. Nursing diagnosis and outcome identification for our conduct disorder patients include risks for other directed violence related to characteristics of temperament, peer rejection, negative parental role modeling, dysfunctional family dynamics. And then we also have impaired social interaction related to negative parental role models impaired peer relations leading to inappropriate social behaviors. Additional nursing diagnoses are defense coping related to low self-esteem and dysfunctional family systems, or low self-esteem related to lack of positive feedback and unsatisfactory parent-child relationship. So goals and outcomes for conduct disorder the client and those around the client should remain safe and unharmed. The client should be able to interact uh, socially in an appropriate manner. They should also be able to accept direction without becoming defensive. We would like to see their self-esteem increased and we would like to see a decrease or absence of exploitive and demanding behaviors towards others. So planning and implementation for conduct disorder should match the outcome or goals that we just mentioned. So the goal for treatment of a child with um, CD or conduct disorder should focus on keeping the client from harming others and from harming themselves. You want the patient to um, have appropriate interactions with others, accept responsibility for their actions. Um, you want to promote feelings of self-worth and you want to set limitations if they start to manipulate or try to manipulate others. So refer to table 23-8 in your text for a comprehensive care plan for your um, conduct disorder or CD patients. But ultimately developing a trusting relationship, providing group situations where they can learn how to interact without this explosive behavior is optimum for them. There is a risk for violence, impaired social interaction, defensive coping, and low self-esteem for our um, CD or conduct disorder patients. Evaluation phase of the nursing process. Evaluation is made of the behavior changes based on achievement of the previously established goals. So we are looking at the care plan to see if it was effective and have we met the outcomes that we desired or the goals. So we have ourselves a question. Conduct disorder may be a precursor to the diagnosis of which personality disorder? So I will explain the personality disorders briefly since we have not completed that chapter just yet. So narcissistic personality disorder is when a person has an exaggerated sense of self-worth. Antisocial personality disorder is when a person fails to conform to rules, fails to develop stable relationships, they have exploitive and manipulating behaviors, 
and they feel no guilt towards these behaviors or remorse. Hysteronic personality disorder is emotional attention seeking behaviors and they are very colorful or dramatic. Then we have our passive aggressive personality disorder, which is indirect aggression, such as undermining, devious, and sly behavior. In class, you are correct. The answer is B, antisocial personality disorder, which is a pattern of socially irresponsible, exploitive, and guiltless behavior that reflects a disregard for others. Conduct disorder can be a precursor to this diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. However, the client has to be 18 or older to receive the antisocial personality disorder diagnosis. So I was wondering if some of you guys chose passive aggressive personality disorder. So that is um, slightly different. So that passive aggressive personality disorder is indirect aggression, undermining devious lie behavior. So in our um, conduct disorder, it's not necessarily indirect aggression. So they are out uh, overtly defiant. In addition to that, um, the definition did mention their difficulty in developing relationships, that antisocial aspect of the disorder. Separation anxiety disorder is characterized by excessive fear or anxiety concerning separation from those to whom the individual is attached. So the anxiety is beyond that which is expected for an individual at this developmental age and interferes with social, academic, occupational, and other areas of function. Onset may occur any time before the age of 18, but it's most commonly diagnosed around the age five or six when a child goes to school. Predisposing factors for separation anxiety disorder. So we have our biological influence, our environmental influence, our family influence. So for biological, there was belief that um, heredity played a part in development of separation anxiety disorder. However, there has not been any determining genetic transmission identified. Then we talked about the temperament of the child. So studies show, have shown that a child's temperament does change from birth throughout their childhood. So for our environmental influences, so if in fact the mother was stressed during pregnancy, such as um, maybe experiencing depression or some type of um, stressful change, then the child would be at greater risk for developing separation anxiety disorder. And then we have our family influences. So you may have the um, overprotective parents or insecure parent-child attachment, maternal depression. It is believed that these children of, the, of these types of parents are at higher risk for developing separation anxiety disorder. And this is developed through role modeling of the parents. So the parents transfer their fears onto the child. The next few slides will go through the nursing process. So assessment for our separation anxiety disorder. So we have um, onset as early as preschool, rarely as late as adolescence. Child has difficulty separating from mother, typically. Separation results from tantrums, crying, screaming, complaints of physical problems, and clinging behaviors. Reluctance or refusal to attend school in majority of these children. Up to 80% refuse to go to school, which meets the criteria for separation anxiety. Younger children may 
shadow or follow around a person of whom they are afraid to be separated. During middle school or adolescence, they may refuse to sleep away from the home. They um, do not have problems developing relationships. They are usually well-liked and reasonably social. Worry. They worry about harm coming to themselves or harm coming to the person they're attached to. Younger children may have nightmares to this effect, and they also may have some type of phobias. Possible nursing diagnosis for our client with separation anxiety. Anxiety, severe, related to family history, temperament, over-attachment to parent, negative role modeling. Ineffective coping related to unresolved separation conflicts and inadequate coping skills. Impaired interaction related to reluctance to be away from the attached figure. Those are outcomes for our separation anxiety disorder clients. So they should be able to maintain a manageable level of anxiety demonstrate coping strategies in dealing with anxiety, especially when uh, separated from the attached figure, and to act appropriately, appropriately with others and spend time away from the attached figure to do so. For our planning and implementation phase for separation anxiety, so of course our interventions here will match our goals, right? So help the client to maintain anxiety levels that are manageable away from the attached figure. Assist with developing coping strategies and developing trust, trusting relationships and their ability to interact appropriately with others. Refer to Table 23-9 in your text for a comprehensive care plan for our socially I'm sorry, our separation anxiety disorder patients. And evaluation. Evaluation requires assessment of the behaviors for which the family sought treatment. Both the client and family will have to change their behavior. General therapeutic approaches for separation anxiety patients. So first we have our behavioral therapy which is concepts based on con classic and operant conditioning. We have our family therapy. So family therapy is um, usually nece necessary for our separation anxiety disorder children or adolescents because they cannot be separated from their family. Um, so therefore the entire family must um, be in therapy in order for the problem to be resolved. We also have group therapy, which group therapy can provide the child or adolescent's opportunity to interact with peers of their um, same association. We also have psychopharmacological um, approaches. So Medication alone does not help separation anxiety. It has to be a combination of both medication as well as psychosocial therapy. So um, it is important for the family to understand that there is no way to just give the child a pill and make them well. You have to stress the importance of psychosocial therapy um, as well as the medication.